That's the intestine. All right, thank you. Well, that was a quick stretch, and uh, uh, Pastor Tomo put me last because he figured either most of the people would be gone or half asleep by now. So we are going to conclude it. Before I begin, I want to thank uh, Senator Kolbeck, who's going to be helping me uh, navigate through this PowerPoint here. And uh, I try to avoid walking with Senator Kolbeck in Lansing, because when I do, people think I'm his, I'm his intern, you know, because of how I look. And uh, so, uh, actually, during my during my campaign, I was very aware of my looks. And uh, right before I spoke today, literally, the thought went through my head. Not one person mentioned my age today. That's great. Good. I'm going to get up there and speak. And back there along the wall, Pastor Jones says, just how old are you exactly? So uh, during my campaign, I was knocking on doors, and I felt very good about where I was at. I was about nine days out before the vote. And I felt like my name ID was pretty high. I felt like people knew who I was. I felt like I had been doing the right things. And uh, I'm knocking on doors, and no one was home, so I left a note in the door. I said, sorry, I missed you. Leave. And I started walking back to the sidewalk. And uh, a gentleman came bursting out of the front door, and he was very excited. And I thought, okay, this is a supporter. This is going to be a good conversation. And he says, young man, young man. And I kind of turn around, and he looks me right in the eye. He says, tell your dad I'm voting for him. <laughs> Well, it's actually me. Sorry to disappoint you. Uh, but uh, So don't worry, Pastor. I get that quite a bit. But thank you for working through this. A little bit about me. I'll make this very brief. I was born and raised in the Petoskey, Michigan area. Uh, my father's been a pastor for 34 years. Uh, I attended college in northern Wisconsin, and I got a degree in history education as well as Bible. Uh, I then mastered... I got a master's degree from Liberty University in public policy, and in 2014, I, let, I felt led of the Lord to run for office, and uh, here I am before you today. So this presentation, actually, I was giving for years before I was elected, and I continue giving it today. I'm giving it in a couple of churches tomorrow. So what I feel, I, I told the Lord, if, if I were ever elected, any opportunity I have to share this uh, with people, I would take it up. So uh, I apologize, and I told this to David Barton before he left. I said, I am so glad you don't have a copyright on all you all you have because this is exactly everything you've ever said. And Dave Coleman in the back said, if he sees any slide that's duplicative of David Barton, he's going to throw a tomato at me. So just be ready because this a lot of this information you've been hearing already. Um, but uh, let's go to the first slide. Now, this presentation is called To Secure the Blessings of Liberty. We got this title from the preamble of the Constitution of the United States of America, which says, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. But I want to focus on one particular part of that. It says to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. One more time. They were not just concerned with securing freedoms to themselves, they were not just concerned with securing freedoms to their posterity, future generations, that's us. They were interested and concerned about securing the blessings of liberty. And it's important to note that difference because a blessing is nothing more than something from the hand of Almighty God. And they were acknowledging that. The liberties that we enjoy today. Now, if there were any people throughout the history of the world that could have thought they achieved it on their own, it was those who fought in the American Revolution. But these people said, our freedoms, our liberties, our blessings from the hand of Almighty God. So that's where we get the title. But I have this broken up in four quick parts. I edited this this morning, trying to make it fit within a half an hour. So I'm going to do my absolute best, and I'm going to speak very quickly. Part one is the way we thought. But if you want to look at the way we thought, there's no better place to look. You're going to have to press it a couple times, unfortunately. It gets very dramatic here. All right. It's the Declaration of Independence, which says this. Press it one more time. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal stations to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. One more time. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare themselves to the cause of the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now that's a mouthful. And that's the opening couple paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence. But there's a few very important, very important principles taught in the opening paragraphs. And it's important that we understand them. So the Declaration of Independence, point one, they mentioned this. The laws of nature and of nature's God. Remember in the opening paragraph, they said, we will base everything, all our governance, all our public policy, on these two laws. The first is the law of nature. Well, what's that? That's called natural law. That's a law instituted by God at creation 
that we can ascertain and discern through our reasoning processes alone. For instance, you do not need the Bible in any culture or society to tell you that to go into someone else's property and to take something that does not belong to you is wrong. It does not take the word of God to tell you that. Romans chapter 1 talks about some sexual behaviors, as some is natural and some is unnatural. It does not take the word of God to tell you that when a child is born, that child belongs to the parents. Those are natural laws. But the problem is, with our finite minds, because of the fall, we're what? Yeah, we're not perfect. Therefore, we need another law to clarify, and that is the law of God. So we thought, we believe in two laws. The law of nature and the law of God. And because of those two laws, we believe this. All men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Because we believe in the law of God, that law teaches us that all men are created equal. Now, here's the interesting point about where we're at today. The word equality is a catchphrase. You're going to hear a lot. It, it, it's, it's a catchy word. And many ungodly characteristics, ungodly policies are promoted under the guise of equality. But what's so funny is people will say, Lee, you have to remember, we're all created equal. And in the next breath, they want to forget about the very laws of that creator. So if we're going to talk about the creator and his laws, it's important that we know what they are. And because we believe in the law of God, we have a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. Whether through the American Revolution, I could get into more detail. David Martin did an excellent job detailing that. They rested on the providence of Almighty God for everything that they accomplished. And if we believe in the law of God today, that's who our faith ultimately will be in. William Blackstone. Now, a little bit about William Blackstone. Uh, he was actually uh, uh, a jurist from Great Britain. And he is relied upon primarily for American jurisprudence. Now, if you look at the 60s and 70s, uh, the founders of our country, they quoted in the 60s and 70s, you understand this is when we were developing our philosophy of government, the Declaration of Independence. The most quoted person was John Locke. If you look at the 80s and 90s of our founders, the most quoted person and the person most, most often evoked was William Blackstone. Here's what he taught, and this is where we got the idea. He said, upon these two foundations, the law of nature and the law of revelation depend all human laws. That is to say, no human law should be suffered to contradict these. So people often to ask me, now you believe in natural law, Lee? Yes, I do. Do you believe in the law of God? Yes, I do. So you're telling me our founder said, the Bible... Every single law in the Bible has to be the law of the land. I said, no, that's not what they believed. David Barton doesn't think that's what they believed. But we believed in two laws, and no law in our country should ever contradict one of those laws. Okay, I can give you plenty of examples. Whether we're talking disciplining children, I think there's a correct way to do it, but I don't think the law should make parents do that. I'd love to make law saying, you know, section one, you have to be good parents. But it's just not that easy. So not every law of the Bible needs to be the law of the land. But no law that we enact should ever contradict the Bible. That's what our founders believed. Well, the next one. In the opinion of the U.S. Supreme Court, Church of the Holy Trinity versus the United States in 1892, this is what our Supreme Court said. Our laws and our institutions must necessarily be based upon and embody the teachings of the Redeemer of mankind. It is impossible that it should be otherwise. And in this sense and to this extent, our civilization, our, our institutions are emphatically Christian. They said, who do our laws, what are they shaped after, what do they embody? Well, they embody the teachings of Jesus Christ. And because our laws embody the teachings of Jesus Christ, you can say our institution is emphatically Christian. Because I have people say in a very pious way, well, you have to understand, Mr. Chapman, there can't be a Christian nation. I understand many of our founders said there's a Christian nation, but a Christian nation, they can't, a nation can't be you know, saved, a nation can't be baptized, a nation can't, you know, you have to understand. I said, well, do you think there could be anything called a Christian family? Well, yeah, I suppose you, so... The whole idea behind a Christian nation meant our laws and our institutions were shaped after the laws of God. I understand that the United States of America was never born again. All right? But that's not what we mean when we say a Christian nation. Go well, to the next slide. So in essence, this is what our public policy looks like. Our laws, our constitution, our declaration of independence, our state constitutions, and everything else in this country drew its authority from the Bible. That's what it looks like. The word of God was supreme. And everything was shaped after that. Go to the next slide. Patrick Henry, people ask me this all the time. Lee, it, do you emphasize this too much? Do you talk about our Christian founding too much? I have been sitting here in this church, in this gymnasium for hours, and all I've been hearing about is the Christian founding of our nation. At what point are we going to just kind of wrap this up? Well, here's what Patrick Henry said. It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded. Not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For this very reason, people of other faiths have been afforded asylum, prosperity, and freedom of worship here. 
So he says, you cannot emphasize it too much. You can't travel and speak about this enough. And let me tell you this, because we believe in Jesus Christ, because we believe he's the savior of the world, for that very reason, we have afforded freedom of religion to everyone else. You understand that? It's because of that. But you know what? This didn't just impact our public policy. This impacted our schools. Harvard University, founded in 1636, and primarily because of the first great migration in 1630, we didn't have enough pastors to begin teaching and preaching to these people. said, so we need a college that's going to train the clergy. So we founded Harvard University. All right? But give me the next slide. Look at what Harvard University stood for. All right, look at this. Let every student be plainly instructed and consider well that the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus, which is eternal life. And therefore, to lay Christ at the bottom is the only foundation of all sound learning and knowledge. Jesus Christ is the foundation for everything that we are going to learn. And the purpose of our existence is going to be to train people in the word of God and the teachings of Jesus Christ. That's Harvard University. That's its founding. But even more uh, interesting, click it one more time. If you look at the crest, give me one more click here. All right. You have veritas on the center of the crest. That's Latin for truth. But notice along the outside of the crest, it's at Christo Ecclesiae, truth for Christ and the church. One more note, though. They did not just stand for truth for Christ and the church. This was symbolic, and I normally have a pointer, so I apologize. This third book right there, notice the other two are face up. The third book is face down. And the symbolism behind that was said, you know what, we're going to study, we're going to work hard, but at the end of the day, we need to lay down our textbooks and we need to apply our faith. Because without faith, it is impossible to please him. They understood that without faith in Jesus Christ and his holy word, then studying is meaningless. And that, that truth is still the same today. That's what Harvard University stood for. Benjamin Rush, we heard all about him by David Barton, but he was signed our Declaration of Independence. He was a physician, I'll leave it at that. Here's what he said about education. The only foundation for a useful education in a republic is to be laid in religion. Without religion, I believe that learning is a real mischief to the morals and principles of mankind. He did not just say you have to teach kids right and wrong using the word of God and religion. He said if you try to teach kids right and wrong apart from the word of God, it will actually only confuse them. They need to understand that if there's a law, there must be a law giver. You will confuse them if you try to teach them morals apart from the Word of God. We see that today in our schools. Look at the next one. Noah Webster, the father of American education, he said this. The Christian religion is the most important and one of the first things in which all children under a free government ought to be instructed. So if you say, well, you're in kindergarten, you're in preschool. I have two, I have two ch children right now in preschool. Uh, now, they do go to a parochial school. They do go to a Christian school. I understand what they're going to be taught. But if you ask Noah Webster, hey, what's the first thing kids need to learn? Now, we have a lot of ideas today. You know, the, the Federal Department of Education, the State Department of Education, we all have our ideas of what kids need to learn today. And I serve on the Education Committee here in the state of Michigan. But Noah Webster said the Christian religion is the first thing they need to learn. I agree with the former speaker who said, can you imagine someone saying that today? Yeah, I'd probably be booed off the committee, right? But we have these discussions. That's what was important in our education system. We'll go to the next slide. What about religious freedom today? Because if I talk to you, is our religious freedom under attack today? You may, you may ask me, is, do we even have religious freedom today? What, what religious freedom are you referring to, Lee? And I understand it is coming under attack, but it's important to know before we come up with a solution, it's important to know why we have a problem with religious freedom today. So let's go to the next slide. Anytime you try to talk to someone about religious freedom or promoting public policy that aligns itself with the word of God or perhaps electing, electing Christians or having kids read the Bible in schools, they always say what to you? How do you get around the phrase or the clause in the, in the Constitution, separation of church and state? I had one person mention on my Facebook page, this was a couple months ago after the Supreme Court hearing with the same-sex marriages, I, I did a pretty strong post. I didn't really hold back on it. And someone says, Lee, I got four words for you. Separation of church and state. And I want to say, well, it's actually five words, but whatever. Who's counting? All right. But people always want to know, what about separation of church and state? Well, let's talk about that just a little bit. And you've heard about you've heard a little bit about it today. But they get that from the First Amendment, supposedly. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And it goes on or abridging the freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people and so on. But where do they get that? Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Let's stop right there. That's called the Establishment Clause. It's extremely important you understand this. 
The purpose of the Bill of Rights, first off, was to limit the federal government. There were many states that would not sign on to the Constitution unless the federal government was limited. This was, first off, limiting Congress, what they could and could not do. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. In essence, we did not want to have a Church of the United States like they had Church of England. We did not want a national church. Secondly, not only can Congress not have a national church, but we will never prohibit the free exercise. That's called the free exercise clause. That's often looked over. That's often looked over. Give me one more click. So up until 1947, you talk about the First Amendment in schools, and they told you that was about freedom of religion. Well, it wasn't until 1947 in a U.S. Supreme Court case, Everson versus the Board of Education, in a decision to decide whether or not we can give taxpayer dollars to parochial schools, where a Supreme Court activist, Hugo Black, decided he wanted to quote from a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to the Danbury Baptist in his first presidential term, when he was assuring the Baptist, he said, don't worry, the federal government can never do anything to your religious freedom because there's separation of church and state. The state can't touch you, is what he was saying. Well, now Hugo Black wanted to quote that, and now our kids are taught that the First Amendment is about separation of church and state. You understand the complete transformation. This has been turned on its head from what its original intent was. And let me tell you why our freedoms are now under attack. Look at the next, the next slide here. Thomas Jefferson said this. God who gave us life gave us liberty. And can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis? A conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are a gift from God, that they are not to be violated but with his wrath. He went on to say, indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. So you ask Thomas Jefferson, what is the greatest security of our religious freedom? He said, when the people are convinced in their mind that their liberties are a gift from God. Because what God gives you, government cannot lawfully take them away. That is what inalienable means. It cannot be taken away. Let me tell you this. When government destroys God, government becomes God. The state supersedes the lawgiver. And the state becomes the sole proprietor and giver of your rights. And I always ask people this. Here's, make this distinction. Please make this note in your heads. I had always, when I, I, I was a teacher for five years and I taught the Constitution, and I would always put on there to the kids, true or false, the First Amendment grants you the freedom of religion. I always get kids who write true. True, yeah, freedom of religion. I remember that. Check, you know. Say false, no. The First Amendment does not grant you the freedom of religion. The First Amendment secures your God-given right for the freedom of religion. Because I ask people all the time, if the First Amendment was gone, would you still have the freedom to express your religious views? Yes, you would, because that's God-given. And that's why right after we talk about, in the Declaration of Independence, stick with me here, right after we talk about inalienable rights, we get into the, what the purpose of government is. In my extended slides, I, I put this, but I didn't put that in today. It says, right after that, quote, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That's the purpose of government. The purpose of government is to secure your God-given rights. Next slide, that's why it's secure, not granted. The Constitution, the Bill of Rights, secure your God-given rights. They do not grant you anything. So question, does it really matter? Lee, what's wrong with being a secular nation as long as we still have our freedom? Now, I've been given this for four years. So if you think I look young now, I just think of what I looked four years ago, okay? All right. But I've been given this for four years. Every single year, this presentation gets a little bit more serious. Think about just four years ago, where we were as a nation, to where we are today, what's being promoted in our public policy, what the courts are now approving and ruling on. Here's the answer. In the short term, it may work fine, but in the long run, we will lose our freedoms. Okay, let me tell you what, what a few of our founders said. We'll go to the next slide. Charles Carroll, you heard about him. All right, signed our Declaration of Independence. He said this, without morals, a republic cannot subsist any length of time. They, therefore, who are decrying the Christian religion, whose morality is so sublime and pure, are undermining the sound foundation of morals, the best security for the duration of free governments. He actually goes a step further. He said, the Christian religion is the foundation of morality which is the foundation of a Republican system of government. You take away Christianity from the base, your morals and your government will fall apart. 
It seemed that they had some insight and they had some wisdom. What's going on next person? John Adams said, we have no government armed with power, capable of contending with human passions, unbridled by morality and religion. Time out. That means this. We don't have a system of government that can control you if you can't control yourselves. We have a limited government with the understanding that you can put self-restrictions on your own appetites. You have to control yourselves. He went on to say this. I'm sorry. Our constitution was made only for a religious and moral people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Our system of government only works when people are religious and moral, and they can control themselves. And let me tell you this. The less people can control themselves on the inside, the more control you need on the outside. Your passions will forge your chains if they are unfettered. Do you understand that? We need self-control, and that's why we didn't teach morality and what morality really was. I can't get into any more detail. We'll go to the next one. George Washington. Yes, we heard this from David Barton. Throw the tomato. Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, of all the dispositions and habits, of all of them, which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. He said in between here, he said, and let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in the exclusion of religious principles. If you exclude your religious principles, you will never have morality. Political prosperity will fall apart. You will not have it unless you have a religious and moral people. That's what our founders thought. Well, the next one. Benjamin Franklin said this, whereas true religion and good morals are the only solid foundation of public liberty and happiness, it is hereby earnestly recommended to the several states to take the most effectual measures for the encouragement thereof. I'm going to make two points, and one I can't get into detail on, but being a state legislator, I want to make this point. He said, since true religion and good morals are the only solid foundation of public liberty and happiness, it is hereby earnestly recommended to the several who? Who? States. Religion was a state issue. And not only was it a state issue, what did they do? Congress wanted to say, you need to take the most effectual measures to encourage it. Not only is religion a state issue, but you as a state do your very best to encourage it because you'll have a better, happier people. Just like George Washington, uh, Brother Duco mentioned, said to the Indians, you need to, know, you need to know Jesus. You'll be a better and happier people than you are today. The same thing that we said to our states, encourage and promote Jesus Christ and religion. All right, so we went through all those. I cut a few out. Were our founding fathers right? Well, this is about religious freedom. So let's go ahead and look. We'll just look around you today. Let's look at the first one. I can't spend too much time on these. 1962, no more prayer in our schools. I wish I could have gone through my educational part in this presentation when we talked about our public schools, our colleges. I gave you a little taste of it, but no more prayer in 1962. What about the next year? Well, no more Bible reading in schools. What about the next thing? 1973, Roe v. Wade. This reversed all state law, state laws uh, that prohibited abortion. You know, the Michigan Constitution still says abortion is illegal. You understand that? It's just that the U.S. Supreme Court has said that Constitution is unconstitutional. Okay, that's our Supreme Court. What about the next one? Lawrence versus Texas in 2003 reversed all state laws prohibiting homosexuality. This is against our law in the books today in Michigan. It's just unconstitutional. Well, what about the next one? We're getting a little closer to home. Windsor versus the United States. I remember when I had to add this to the presentation, and everyone was like, oh, no, we're getting there. 2013, this overturned Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act. For years, for four years, my next slide, I had a blank verse blank. And I said, reverse all state laws defining marriage as one man and one woman. And I said, it means no expertise on my own, I was repeating other people, but I said, someday I'm going to be able to have something, I'm going to put this in there, and this is going to be the Supreme Court case where they supposedly overturned our marriage law. Well, I don't have that blank anymore. So we see it, and this was this year. Now, there's a couple of notes. Number one, yes, we are losing our freedoms. We are losing our God-given rights to express our religious beliefs sincerely before God and to our fellow man. But secondly, what else do you see? All these main drastic changes in public policy have come through what? The Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, not Congress, not who makes our laws. Now, before before we had this, you know, 2015 case, people always said to me, Lee, don't you understand that like 37 states have same-sex marriage? Michigan's got to get with it. And I said, yeah, but do you know only three of those actually did it through voting it in themselves? No, no, the press didn't tell me that. <laughs> yeah, well, of course. I tell people all the time, if you don't read the newspapers, you're uninformed. If you read the newspapers, you're misinformed. So take your pick, whichever one you want to be. All right. But that's, that's where it's at today. 
We'll go to the next slide. Is there hope for America? Now, if I were to cut that off and say, uh, Pastor John, I think, and uh, I'll, I'll be on my way, that'd be pretty depressing. All right, because if we're going to talk about where our freedoms are at without a solution, it's somewhat pointless. So is there hope? What's the solution? But let, let's look what's happening in our country. There's an institutional drift. Remember the, the crest from 1800? Harvard University? Truth for Christ in the church. Book face down. Well, that's 2010. Christ in the church completely taken out of the picture. And the third book is now face up. There is no limit to what we can learn, and there is no need to apply our faith. This is very open on their crest. They no longer stand for what they said for. That's an institutional drift. There's an educational drift. What we used to teach our kids, the New England Primer, the Noah Webster's Blueback Speller, the McGuffey's Readers, the Word of God, we now send books like this home with our kids. In our mother's house, a book that openly supports the lesbian lifestyle. Oh, uh, don't teach morality in our schools. Oh, they are teaching morality in our schools. Oh, you cannot legislate morality. All law is legislated morality. The question is not, will morality be legislated? The question is, whose morality will be legislated? That's an educational drift. There's a philosophical drift. Freedom of religion is now known as separation of church and state. Well, the next slide. Judicial drift. Remember where the word of God was supreme? Everything got its laws and its authority from our Bible? Well, this is what's next. Our Supreme Court. Our Supreme Court will tell you what the Constitution says. We will no longer reference the Declaration of Independence and don't even bother mentioning the Bible, which is now completely out of the picture. Our Supreme Court is supreme in this country. We'll go to the next slide. What's the solution? All right, so here we go. What's the solution? Let's start with what it's not. It's not education. I, I was an educator before I went into politics. I'm a strong believer in education. I'm a strong believer in what you're doing right now. What I'm doing right now, we're trying to learn more. But that is not the solution to fixing our country. It's not. You can get you can get the Bible back in education, and that's not the solution. Well, well, let's look at that. what else it's not. It's not political activism. Believe me, if you want to be an activist, come see me later. I'll give you my card. And you can go I thought I'd say that off the microphone. I'm a believer in political activism, but that's not going to save our country. Oh, I know what he's going to say. I like to be Christians. This is a plug to go find the Christians running for office because they are going to save us. The elected Christians will not save this country. The only thing that can save the United States of America is a personal revival that changes the hearts of others. We need a revival in our country. We need Jesus Christ in our country changing the hearts and minds of people. Let me tell you something. A result of that revival will be a return to Christian education. A result of that revival will be returning to political activism. A result of that revival will be a return to elected Christians. The revival comes first. We all know this passage of scripture, Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people, that's us, that's you here today. You're claiming that you are saved, you're born again by the name of Jesus Christ. You believe that he, was, he died on the cross for your sins, he was buried, he rose again three days later from the grave. You believe that you're a Christian, that's you. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. We need the healing of this nation that only Jesus Christ can provide. That's the only thing that will save our country today. It's not electing Christians. It's not even finding a young Christian running for office. We need the hearts and minds of Americans changed, and that only happens through the Word of God and through the Holy Spirit. Lewis Cass, the first governor of Michigan, I got two more slides. He said, the fate of Republican government is indissolubly bound up with the fate of the Christian religion. And a people who reject its holy faith will find themselves the slaves of their own evil passions and of arbitrary power. Arbitrary meaning from outside. He said, our system of government is bound up with the Christian religion. If you rip away Christianity, our system of government will fall apart. And you'll become a slave to whatever your passions and wants are. In other words, each person will do what's right in their what? Own eyes. That's the society will be. And you know what? We'll end with scripture. I'm sorry, I have two more slides. I have one more after this. I lied. Forgive me. Psalm 33, 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We also know that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach unto any people. One of our late presidents, one of my, my probably my favorite president of all time, I've memorized many of his quotes. He said, if we ever forget that we're one nation under God, we will have become one nation gone under. 
do not forget that we will be blessed if God is our Lord. And that's why we have the national motto, in God is our trust. But in ending, I want to leave you with this quote. The ways of God are mysteriously profound beyond all comprehension. Who by searching can find him out? That's a quote from scripture. God has destroyed nations from a map of history for their sins. Nevertheless, go well, the next slide. My hopes prevail. Above my fears for our republic, the times are dark, the spirits of ruin are abroad in all their power, and the mercy of God alone can save us. It's Abraham Lincoln talking during, during a very dark time in American history, and I believe the same thing applies to us today. If you're here and you're, you're coming for solutions, you realize that our country has turned its back on God. You realize that we can only receive God's blessing if we return back to the principles we were founded on and to the word of God and accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. You are right. Proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't be intimidated. Don't be backed into a corner. Our nation needs healing, and our hate, our nation needs revival. And the only person that can provide that revival is Jesus Christ, and we find his teachings in the word of God. So proclaim it, and may the mercy of God be on the United States of America. Thank you for letting me present today.